after that wonderful meal, we'll come to the final portion. Now, Vienna at the beginning of the 20th century was not only famous for its academic gatherings, but also for the so-called salons or jours. Not far from here is a building that is now the Hotel Bristol. My great-great-grandparents, Friedrich Hayek's grandparents, were the hosts of such a salon once a month. These gatherings were attended not only by economists like Wieser, Bimbaverk, and Schumpeter, but also by the physicist Erwin Schrödinger and his parents, as well as members of the Kalmus and Wittgenstein families. People back then, brackets contrary, unfortunately, to nowadays, were very much interested in what went on in disciplines other than their own. Our second honoree tonight is also a man whose work spans economics, philosophy, and many other disciplines. Here to laud him is the governor of the Central Bank, Professor Dr. Holtzman. Professor Holtzman, please. Meine Damen und Herren, einen wunderschönen Abend wünsche ich. Meine Rede war ursprünglich auf Deutsch geschrieben, aber wie ich mitbekommen habe, haben einige englische Kollegen gemeint, auch die Kollegen, es wäre besser, wenn ich sie auf Englisch halten würde, was ich auch nunmehr tun werde. Ladies and gentlemen, we are gathered in this venerable house of industry to honor two great thinkers and academics. We heard about uh, the events of Mr. Elon Butler, and we have Eric Weder here to get the Lifetime Award of, for Hayek. Past recipients of the Hayek Lifetime Achievement Award included esteemed laureates such as the Peruvian writer and Nobel laureate uh, in literature, Maria Vargas the Scottish historian, Lyon Ferguson, formerly Oxford and Harvard, and Snahub Institution in California, the successful American historian Dari McCroskey, the successful American entrepreneur Peter Thiel, and influential American economist Arthur Laffer, after whom the Laffer curve was uh, called. I extend my hearted congratulations to Edmund Butler and his uh, conjuncture and was impressed by what was, has been told to him and I was even more impressed by his thank you speech and I took note of it and uh, <laughs> <laughs> and without paying a fee I will use it in the future. Uh, it is now my special honor to give uh, the laudatory speech uh, for Professor Erich Wede. And uh, on his occasion, let me draw connections between uh, the work of Professor Wede, the Austrian School of Economics, and the economic history of China, and the timelessness insights of uh, uh, Friedrich Hayek, but also Joseph Schumpeter. The Austrian School of Economics, shaped by outstanding thinkers like Karl Menger, Friedrich Wieser, Ludwig von Mises, uh, uh, Josef Schumpeter, and of course uh, Friedrich August von Hayek, has always emphasized the importance of individual freedoms and entrepreneurial innovation. It teaches us 
that economics is more than numbers and diagrams. It is the result of human actions and decision. Professor Wede has incorporated these principles in his impressive body of work and applied them historically. His analysis of economic history, particularly regarding China, demonstrated how economic freedom and institutional conditions determine the country's path. China, once characterized by central planning, had experienced an unprecedented rise in the last decades, partly due to the greater introduction of market economic elements, a phenomenon Professor Wede has extensively and accurately studied over the past decades. Hayek, whose name is uh, used for this award, bears out to say, competition is not only the basis for efficient economy, it is also essential protection of freedom. These words are reflected in Professor Veda's work, which consistently emphasizes the importance of competition, freedom as cornerstone of a prosperous society. Joseph Sumpeter, another pioneer of economic science, coined the term creative destruction. He understood it to mean the process in which old structures are replaced by innovative ideas and technologies, leading to long-term growth and prosperity. Actually, it's the only way for long-term growth and prosperity. His concept is also found in Erich Weder's work, which continually emphasizes the necessity of adaptation and innovation in a rapidly changing world. In summarizing Erich Weder's research, the teaching of the Austin School of Economics, developments in China and the thoughts of Friedrich Hayek and Schumpeter, one thing become clear. Economic freedom and the courage for innovation are the key to prosperity and progress. Erich Weder has impressively demonstrated this in his life's work and provided us with Im uh, immensely valuable insights for the future. But let the honoree himself speak on this topic. As Professor Wede stated in the Neue Zürcher Zeitung in the article of March 16, 2008, titled Opportunities for the Poor, I quote Verpatin, quote, globalization, one could also say the global expansion of capitalism, the increasing autonomy of the world economy from the fragmentation of political system has already freed hundreds of millions of people from direct poverty and contributed to the income distribution among the people of the world becoming a more egalitarian uh, for perhaps two decades. And on this, uh, I'd like to add my own note on this one. It was uh, uh, last year that I had the honor to visit the Pope. And I thought, OK, what uh, can I tell him? What kind of messages in these few minutes which are up there? Originally, I thought, well, perhaps I talk uh, uh, about the need for women to have a larger role uh, for priests to marry, etc. And when I did this up front uh, uh, with uh, clerics there, they said, please stop it. They have enough of the Catholics going there. So what is the key message? I said, well, I know that the Pope is highly interested in poverty issues there. And I fully agree with him as a former World Bank uh, director where poverty alleviation was the key topic. I think this is also a main topic. So what can I say? I want to tell the Pope, uh, Father, if you're really interested in reducing poverty, you must not condemn capitalism because it's the only way out of poverty. <laughs> uh, 
Friedrich August von Hayek, whose name has this award, also said, competition is not only the basis of an efficient economy, it is also protection. And uh, Joseph Humpet, another pioneer of economic science, coined this term, what we heard before. So, uh, one could hardly capture Friedrich August Hayek's fundamental ideas more clearly than in his timeless own words. The basic illusion of socialism is that poverty can be eliminated by redistributing existing wealth. And as we know, unfortunately, this topic is now again highly up and it is something which will unfortunately or fortunately not work, but unfortunately some believe in it. Let me now draw on some of his specifics what he had. Vede, China and Russia. Uh, Erich Vede writes in China and Russia reflection on the rise and fall of uh, world powers. At the end of the 70s, the economic balance of power between the Soviet Union and China was approximately 4 to 1. By the end of the 1990s, the economic balance uh, uh, changed uh, to something like 1 to 3 or already 1 to 4. Also, although the disintegration of the Soviet Union contributed to the rapid change of the balance of powers, more important is that the only China had effectively uh, reprivatized agriculture and uh, in the 80s and the only China allowed township villages enterprises and private entrepreneurs alongside state owned enterprises in the 80s that China had consistently uh, uh, better done than Russia uh, to abandon autarky policies in favor of world market orientation and that only China developed a partial substitute for the rule of law with market-preserving federalism. Russia was faster than China in privatizing state enterprise in the 1990s, but we have seen the result that emerged from it. China rise holds the risk of rising from a central geopolitical location and the opportunities that free trade and globalization offer, especially for the provincial of law, Albeit we have to admit more recently, they seem to have uh, forgotten the way that brought them so far. I was sir, this year again in Tokyo and Beijing and could myself see how to say how the past uh, 40 years had been successful, but more recently the shadows of forgetting uh, the main recipes are uh, forgotten and starting to be forgotten. China's central location between the region rivals, India, Japan, and Russia, along with emerging rivalry between China and the US, should overburden China, because it is not rational to drive rivals to desperation in the nuclear age. The West has an interest in preventing such geopolitical constellation and instead co-opting and integrating China and its neighbors into a liberal world and economic order. Because foreign, China's foreign policy is currently more oriented towards economic interest uh, than real, realpolitik, the success of a cooperation strategy is at least conceivable. These are the words, we hope they are true. Uh, Eric Wede made this uh, accurate analysis in an article, China and Russia, in 2001. He was very optimistic. I hope his optimism pays out and uh, uh, racialism will return. Let me, towards the end, now turn towards his life and research. The question arises, who is Professor Eric Wede? Uh, who conducts geopolitical causation research and prognostication like few others. A look at his biography reveals the enormous press of his research and knowledge. Here are just a few impressive key data. 
Unfortunately, I don't have this private uh, information that uh, uh, other speakers have about the laureate, so I have to stick uh, to what I could get from the web. So I was unable to find somebody who would talk out of school about your other uh, positive uh, and uh, less positive events. Unfortunately, I couldn't find it out. It will come next time, okay, promise to that. Uh, Erich Wede earned a degree in psychology in 1966 at the University of Hamburg and completed a second degree in sociology and political science, including a year of study in the United States. He received his doctorate in 1970 and achieved the academic qualification to teach political science at the University of Mannheim in 1975. In 1978, he was appointed professor of sociology uh, uh, at the University of Cologne. And uh, uh, he was visiting professor later on at the Bologna Center uh, uh, in, 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 in uh, John Hopkins University until he accepted the position uh, 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 at the University of Bonn for the chair of sociology. And what I found out, we almost missed there because uh, when my then doctor father moved on to Bonn, uh, he gave me, uh, he offered me to go with him. And since it was before my habilitation, I declined. Otherwise, we may have been at the same faculty there. Uh, besides, how to say, his visible academic achievements, he is, of course, a person who is heavily involved in, in academic uh, management. And this includes, and I will be short here, a number of memberships as editor and, and, and editorial boards in the following journals. Uh, Pacific Focus of Korean Journal of International Studies, uh, International Interaction American Journal for International Politics, Journal of Conflict Resolution, New Asia, a Korean Journal, etc., etc., etc. Other things uh, which uh, uh, one has to tell about him is uh, he uh, published more than 200 scholarly works, including numerous monographies. Uh, and uh, he's just an excerpt uh, what I will tell you. I know you want to have your dessert, so I will be short. Uh, world politics and causes of war in the 20th century, a quantitative empirical study in 1975. Western German elite views and national security and foreign policy issues uh, in 1978. Uh, economy, state and society in 1990. Asia and Western political culture, uh, determinants of the economic development 2002, and balance of power, globalization, and capitalist peace. Ladies and gentlemen, Erich Wede has distinguished himself in his academic career with a multitude of publications that deal with the complex themes of global politics, economic development, and social change. His work is characterized by a rare combination of theoretical depths and empirical position, through which he has made significant contributions to the understanding of international power structures and the promotion of prosperity. Particular noteworthy is his ability to use interdisciplinary approaches to open new perspective on existing problems. His publications have resonated not only in academia, but also in politics and public discourse. Through his clear, accessible, yet profound analysis, he has reached a wide audience and influenced the way politicians, policymakers, and general public think about global challenges. Allow me now, also because of timeliness uh, relevance, to conclude with another brief excerpt from a contribution by Erich Wede to Huntington's Clash of Civilizations. Quote, Huntington's Clash of Civilization 
is not fate, but at most the result of misguided Western policy and, of course, political misjudgment of other cultural circles. But humanity has a chance, which I would call a call capitalist peace. The democratic peace is one only component of it, or through, perhaps, the crowning glory. The basis of this is a liberal policy, open world markets, and the overcoming of mass poverty. Here, poverty comes again. The ethical prerequisite of this capitalist foundation for demographic peace can be described with uh, Herbert Giersch as follows. The basic principle of cosmopolitan morality is non-discrimination, also called most favored nations in trade, ask for the price that he or she offers or demands, but not for the convictions or religion that inspires him or her. The principle of non-discrimination is universal and the scene of Kant's categorical imperative. It can be considered as, a world, as the world law. The capitalist beast is the alternative to the clash of civilization. Dear Professor, we... Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I can encourage you, these are not my words, these are his words, okay? So, dear Professor Wede, on behalf of the Vienna Friedrich August von Hayek Institute, I would like to congratulate you and your outstanding contributions and your commitments to promoting a deep understanding of the complex dynamics of our world, as well as for our tireless work and significant influence of the social sciences on the occasion of awarding the Hayek Lifetime Achievement Award. I wish you all the best and also personally extend my warmest congratulations to you, sir. Lieber Erich, danke dir für deine wundervolle Arbeit, die du die letzten Jahrzehnte nicht nur der Jugend gewidmet hast, deinen Studenten, sondern uns allen. Der Hayek Lifetime Achievement Award steht dir mehr als nur zu. Lieber Robert, würdest du das bitte dem Erich übergeben? Sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, liebe Mitglieder des Hayek-Instituts, sehr geehrter Herr Holzmann, herzlichen Dank für diese Auszeichnung und herzlichen Dank vor allem auch dafür, dass in Ihrer Laudatio mein geopolitisches Interesse deutlich anklang. Ich will der Versuchung widerstehen, jetzt ein Korreferat zur, Geo äh, zur geopolitischen Lage zu halten, obwohl ich echt in Versuchung bin. Instead of that, I want to say and to explain why I'm so happy about getting this award in Austria. Because whenever I think about my life, I come to the conclusion that a great deal of what I have learned in my life and what I have achieved in my life, I owe to Austrian thinkers. The first Austrian to whom I think I owe all the jobs which I ever obtained and therefore the material basis of my life was an Austrian professor of social psychology at the University of Hamburg in the 1960s, Peter Hofstetter, 
From him, I learned psychometrics. I cannot explain what psychometrics is in a one-liner, but it's a technical field, and if you know psychometrics, you can learn the basics of econometrics in half a day. So it's very useful. It's the other way around true also. If you know econometrics, you can learn psychometrics in half a day. So these technical fields are extremely similar. And whatever you learn first doesn't matter if you learn one part of these quantitative studies you easily learn the others. And quantitative techniques are very useful if you want to earn some money. So this I know to an Austrian. The second insight which I learned from an Austrian are the insights of Karl Popper. And these, I think, can be summarized in a one-liner. If a theory is not falsifiable, it says nothing about reality. The next theory which I understood and which I learned from an Austrian, I learned from Ludwig von Mises. And Mises' basic insight, I think, can also be summarized in a one-liner. If you want a rational allocation of resources, you need private property, you need competition, you need scarcity prices. And then I learned a basic insight from Friedrich August von Hayek. And I think by far his most important insight was what he published in 1945 in his paper about knowledge. And this can be summarized in a one-liner, and that is, if you want to exploit human knowledge, which is scattered across thousands or millions of heads, you need economic freedom. Otherwise, most human knowledge will be wasted and people will remain poor. And then, the last Austrian, from whom I learned a lot, is Josef Schumpeter. But I'm not quite sure whether he is at the same level as the other Austrians. I, I cannot imagine how the insights from Popper, Mises, or Hayek can be misapplied. But Schumpeter's basic insight, again in a one-liner, is if you want prosperity, you are condemned to permanent structural adaptation or creative destruction. But if I look to the current Minister of Economic Affairs in Germany, Robert Habeck, and if you apply this Schumpeterian insight, and know nothing about the insights of Popper, and even less about the insights of Mises or Hayek, then I think you are condemned to the kind of economic policy from which my country suffers. <laughs> Thank you very much for your patience. I am grateful for the honor which I received today.